Welcome to our 115th Friday Feature Artist Interview. Today, we have the pleasure of diving deep into the artwork of Marjorie Amdua, an artist whose work continually blurs the lines between the expected and the unexpected, the familiar and the unfamiliar. With a career that expands across decades and with 60 solo exhibitions under her belt, Marjorie, with her multi-dimensional perspective, constructs what she passionately terms felt narratives. To truly experience her art is to suspend logic for a moment, allowing oneself to be swept up in the juxtaposition of objects, images and intricate concepts. There's an unmistakable sensation when enveloped in one of Marjorie's site-specific installations, which she's been curating for over three decades. It's as though you've been entered into a protective cocoon where architecture assumes the role of the human body. The walls surrounding you become a symbolic cloak, much like a public display of one's identity through clothing. Hailing from Pittsburgh, Marjorie's artistic journey has been nothing short of illustrious. She honed her skills at the revered Carnegie Mellon University, earning her BFA and later achieved her MFA from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Renowned publications like Sculpture Magazine, New American Paintings and Fibre Arts have all celebrated her contributions, ensuring her global recognition. In the span of just five years, from 2017 to 2022, Marjorie took on a staggering 10 international projects, leaving an indelible mark across borders. Both the US Embassy and the Philadelphia Convention Centre have recognised her genius by including her artworks in their permanent collections. And soon, Rutgers University of Camden will be adding pieces from her fresh series Inside Out to their esteemed collection. In the fascinating venture starting this January, Marjorie will transform the Stedman Gallery and Rutgers University, Camden, into a creative studio and an ever-evolving exhibition space. Central to this mission is the harmonious blend of individual and collective creativity. And later in the year, Cedar Crest University will also play host to such a dynamic experience. Like many, Marjorie uses the art of creation to understand her place in the world, and she shares this with others through interactive art installations. So one doesn't merely observe the art, they participate. In Marjorie's own words, by manifesting what was not initially understood, my work becomes both mirror and door. Participation by others elevates my studio practice to the celebration of resilience. And tonight, we get to journey with her, beyond the mirror and through the door. So please help me in welcoming Marjorie Amdua as our 115th Friday feature artist. Hey, Marjorie. Hi, Angela. I hope you enjoyed your slideshow. I loved putting it together for you. I'll, let, I'll take you any time to give an introduction. That was beautiful, and thank you. Thank you oh, for help the room. No problems at all. I mean, we had a lot to work with. So I wanted to let you know that we've got people from all over the world, not to make you nervous or anything, but we do have people from Melbourne. Hi, Pam. We have got people from France, and it's midnight there, so I hope you're tucked up in bed. Karen Olsen from Maine, and we were just talking about Maine behind the scenes, so that's cool. Hi, Karen. And Jana's from South Carolina, hello. And Vivian from the UK in Bath, it's late there as well. So that's awesome to have people here. And um, Heidi um, enjoyed the slideshow as well. So that's great. Marjorie and everyone watching, we've got a lot to get through today. In fact, we were just talking about um, the prolific work that Marjorie's done over her career. And she actually sent me through 300 images to go through. Um, and we've narrowed that down to about 88 today. <laughs> so just to give people a bit of context, we're going to have a lot to get through today. It's going to be an amazing talk. Um, but before we get started, Marjorie, I mean, I'd really love to know, or what can you tell us 
about what we need to understand about your past to understand the artist that you are today? First of all, I want to thank you and Fiber Arts Takes Two for including me in the series. I mean, really, I'm quite honored. Um, in terms of talking about my work and um, the past, I will share, like, honestly, that I am a maker of art at, originally as a way to survive. Um, mm -hmm. I think all, I think most artists, or at least visual artists when they're young, probably are not able to speak through language effectively and share what they really want to. And somehow outside of language, they start making marks on a page to, so that they get to see their present. Um, I think obviously as we become more professional, that gets embedded in the work. And then there's all these years of trainings and sharing and much more. But I will still say that today, I manifest things visually to understand my place in the world and it gives me a backbone. And then I'm, I'm a better person. I'm a better professor. I'm a better partner, everything about that. So there is something about making something outside and then being able to respond to that, that carries a truth for me. Um, wow. And I all, and I say, I build intimate relationships with inanimate objects and over a long period of time. And I would say that that's, you know, some, something in there will, um, you'll be able to understand better as I talk more about my work. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to start. And people will really now start to understand when we go through the images. That's amazing. I loved how you said that you're a better person when you make, like when you make. And I think a lot of people who are artistic can relate to that. Like if you give yourself the time to be creative, you're actually a better person for it. We actually experienced exactly that thing yesterday, <laughs> a big day at the desk, a big day working and it was late and we were like, no, we need to go and do something creative for an hour because we'll be better for it tomorrow. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey into the art world and sort of also how you bridge the divide between art and craft because I know what you do is very like labor intensive and I'd just love to hear a little bit about that before we get into the images as well. Um, so I actually don't see that I do bridge um, uh, you know art and craft. I feel like my work actually um, it's a commentary so it comments on um, art as well as craft and then I juxtapose them so inherent so in a way I don't fit neatly into either and I'm comfortable being in between, but bridging them, I, I see it differently. You know, I, I see that as more, I make them rub up against each other. And uh, there's a, you know, so it's something about that uh, sandwiching and that tension that I like. Yeah. And how did you journey into the art world? What was, what was your career path? Well, I started off as actually a painter because I thought painters and sculptors were really the only true artists. And basically uh. I found that in making paintings, I was not very good. And I could not handle the immediacy of taking my brush to the canvas and making images and knowing when I was done. So it was mm. a joke in school that you know, I had just made a hundred paintings within a painting and I never kind of was able to stand strong when it was finished. So I then moved into printmaking, which for me slowed me down. And those of people who know me, my mind is just always, you know, churning. And so it was the slowing down process within printmaking and having to print one color at a time that gave me the ability to succeed and, uh, make work and that still impacts the work today so that's Amazing. why ritual and repetition are key factors in my work so the printmaking is still embedded in the work yes yes fascinating and what about you know before we delve into the Im images can you share a little bit about your connection between the materials and the meaning. And I'm sure this will come up in conversation as well as we get going. Like, I'd love you to keep touching on this point because I, I find it fascinating. I'm sure our audience does as well. But how do you consider it to be autographic, autobiographical, sorry, auto, 
how you say it, Marjorie? Autobiographical. Autobiographical. <laughs> yes, thank you. In nature. <laughs> um, well, I have found that even though I work pretty much in the land of abstraction, the domain of abstraction, my work is driven from um, a, a personal place. And usually what I'm trying to rectify or understand somewhere deep within drives each body of work. And I don't know if you've had the experience of when you settled in on making a decision, the world starts delivering you things. Yes. You know, it's kind it's like you say, I'm going down this path, and then all of a sudden all this stuff shows up. So I don't exactly know why I could tell you that window screen showed up. You'll I'll, we can talk about this more when I we talk about the work or cosmetic sponges. I mean, again, we'll talk about this. And now my interest in sewing and making second skins as a way of dealing with vulnerability also speaks to um, personal issues. So these objects, it's that inanimate object and what it is in the world to others, I try to elevate it to having me more meaning than it does in our real actual life. Wow. That makes any sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I just okay. want to acknowledge too that coming on live, sharing your work, talking about your work <laughs> is quite a vulnerable thing to do. And I know that I've done like probably a hundred of these interviews. I still get really nervous before it. So, you know, kudos okay. to you for getting that there. And I'm just loving listening to how you're describing your work. So thank you. And um, I'm sure people are really enjoying it as well. So let's get stuck into some images. I can't wait to share this. Okay. <laughs> so we've prepared um, a slideshow um, and we're going to go through a, a number of body of works <clears throat> um, of, of Marjorie's work. So tell us about these commercial products in the beginning and can you give us a glimpse how they have informed your work or opened up new avenues for ex exploration for you? So these particular images that you're going to show are patterns for making garments. And my work has always had a nod toward garment and textiles. And usually when I take on a body of work, like what we were talking about, my way of working has to do, uh, and the materials I choose has to do with the issues that I'm dealing with. And I usually have no idea how I'm gonna work with the materials, except that I'll pick a template or a pattern that exists in the real world and I'll follow the directions except I'll do it with some unorthodox, you know, material. And as I learn how it's supposed to be done, I screw it up. So I literally, though, use that as a way to acclimate myself before I take off and go in certain directions. So as you can see, these flower um, uh, shapes, you know, you'll find that in terms of people making bouquets. So I take them and make other things, but I actually do start with um, things that you can, you'll can you find in a material store, in, um, an arts and crafts store. And so this, is, for example, is um, a major outdoor uh, sculpture based on a perfume bottle. And I took lace and then I would blow it up to make templates and I would carve uh, these patterns into cement. So something starting from a um, garment pattern ends up in a large sculpture outdoors. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's an evolution. And, and a lot of things that these images that you're showing, a lot happens in between when I make my first uh, small dress, so to speak, and then I make something that's monumental like this image. Yeah, and you can just see the scale of it there in the garden. Amazing. And there's plenty more of those that you did, which was, which was, yeah, they're fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Next, there's the window screens. Can you talk us through these installations and, and the immersive experience of this body of work? Well, again, um, what I would say too, like these, the, these large purses, are stand-ins like in a way for the body. So the issue of the body is always inherent in the work. However, um, it's I, I, I don't do it representationally or figuratively as we would experience a body. However, the images that you're gonna show here, I don't believe we're gonna see a major installation 
These are more groupings. And these also are started with patterns from slip covered chairs. So I would make the slip, I would follow the directions and they would become uh, these sculptures. And they, I called them my ladies in waiting. And for me, that I found a way to have them stand up, but really you looked through them. So it started to um, talk about lineage, which is something that I've been interested in my whole adult you know, career. So I was also able to dress them, you know, with with bows and really frilly things um, that I would never have in my own life. But it started also to talk about the, the issue of femininity. Um, and here I was dealing with those kinds of things, but I was working with window screen wire that cuts the hell out of your fingers, you know, and we had to, uh, it was, you know, it was kind of like, come close, stay away, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to the juxtaposition of those two things. Um, yeah. How did this also, body of work? I did, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go, sorry. I, I would say that for, this, this work was done in New Mexico where I taught for 12 years before I came to Philadelphia. And I would say that the land, okay, so here's more of a um, installation. The landscape influenced my work that in that color disappeared. And I think if you knew, if you know the uh, New Mexico land, you know, the landscape is very, very nuanced um, greens, let's say greens and browns. So how the how the um, landscape influenced me was the lack of color in this uh, sparseness. So um, that's all. <laughs> Amazing. And how did this body of work help you find your voice as an artist? Well, I would actually say that it's interesting, Angela, that um, I went to high school like in three years and I went through college in three years. And so and then graduate school and I was out of school when I was 22. And it was like I was on the fast track to somewhere. I don't know where the somewhere, you know, was, but I was on that track. But I hadn't really like my voice and my owning my voice was still kind of underground. And so I was experimenting with so many different materials and I was fortunate because I was getting exhibitions, but I couldn't, I couldn't really own, uh, couldn't really call the work totally mine or I didn't believe in it to, till I got to this work. And all of a sudden it fit because I've always, you know, this issue of gender um, and, the feminist movement. And I say that my work stands on the shoulders of feminist artists. And so this work was a way to uh, deal with absence and presence. And those were issues that's also been in the work um, for lots of years. And it dealt with my Jewish history. That's also with, I don't really, I didn't really talk about this during the time, mm. but um, my work is both a celebration, but it also deals with loss. So when you look mm -hmm. at this work, you'll see abundance, but you'll also see uh, the sense of emptiness. And I think that that's embedded in the work. If that answers your question. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Moving on from here, we're going into another installation in a public, in a public, a very public art space, or you turned it into an art space, but it's a very utilitarian space traditionally. But it's important to note here that there's been many, many bodies of work in between what we're seeing now and this next series. Can you talk us through this project, which actually took two years to complete, and it was named Walking on Sunshine, where you made an installation within a, tra a subway station? Yes. So this, um, what we're looking at now, the, uh, the subway station or the public art project, came really at the end of like what you were talking about, this series that had to do with paint by number. I would say this was an important series, but it did not deal necessarily with gender issues. It dealt with class issues in terms of when you did paint by numbers and they were beautiful scenes. And I was talking about those kinds of things. So when you talk about art and craft, that was inherent in this body of work. But in terms of the um, subway station, I remember, you know, making public art, uh, it's about place. 
you know, and it's about making places and the people that live there, feel, you know, feel important and grounded. So for me, I wanted to deal with what was going on in the area, but I also wanted to continue this paint by number um, series. So I remember standing out on a corner asking people who's, you know, who was the artist that stands out in their mind? And it was basically, some people said Van Gogh, some people said um, Jackson Pollock and all these things And somebody said Beethoven. And I said, okay, you know, I was just gonna bring them all together to create these floors that basically gave people an opportunity to stand on something from before they were, they were going from here to there. So it was a really an opportunity to walk on a painting and leave the fact that you were in an underground desolate subway station. So yeah. to bring that bit of joy. And it also brought the issue of carpet um, to the floor too. So that, you know, it was like a floor carpet in a subway station. I just love this image here as well. And that there's the flash of the orange on the train to the to, and mimicking on the floor. I mean, was that done on purpose? That's amazing. <laughs> no, I mean, I, if I could just, this image is like a perfect image. Do you know what I mean? Is like, it? It's, it is what you just said. And, and it's in, and it's in motion. So yeah. um, the other thing I wanted that you, you can't see this in these slides is I wanted it to feel like you were standing on a collage. So I made these 13 foot drawing collages in my studio and then they were scanned and um, produced and then embedded in resin. So it was a way of bringing the digital and the hands on together in a, in a like I said, and again, an underground station. Tell me this, this, these, this, are, the, these are the collages. Yeah, these are the collages, they're beautiful. But it took two years and I was going to ask you, it must have felt more like you were a civil engineer than an artist. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, it's a very different, it is a very different process. And what I learned from that experience was I probably would never have had the experience of making something to that scale, which is amazing. However, I'm really a maker. Uh, and so, like you said, working on this project, it's not like I, I was dealing with contracts and civil engineers. And so as I went through this, this project, I kept feeling like when this is over, I need to go and hibernate in my studio because I just wanted to get back there and make. So, yeah. yeah so if that makes sense. I bet. Marjorie, I just wanted to give you a bit of um, audience participation. Anna Wagner, -Ott. hi, thanks for joining us, Anna. Lovely to see you too. She says amazing mm. work. Um, Hi, welcome, Anna. Annette. <laughs> I know. welcome, Annette. You know, Anna, of course, you do. Yeah, and and at first time here live, welcome. And Wilma's really enjoying the conversation. Thanks so much. So, oh, and thanks, Deborah White. Yes, able to scale your work. Yeah, <laughs> and Anna says hi back. So, fantastic. Thanks, guys, for all your participation. That's lovely. So, we've worked with. So far, we've seen concrete, we've seen window uh, screens, which you mentioned were very hard and, you know, tough to work with. We've worked, as a civil engineer, we've worked with resin. We see a major shift here in your medium. Tell us about a special gift that was brought to you by the Google gods. <laughs> so, um, you know, I finished that body of work or I finished that project. I went back in my studio and I had this feeling like I wanted to fall into something soft. You know, I had this idea. I need to make something soft. It, I didn't know anything more than that. I knew it wasn't a pillow that I wanted to do. And as we talked about before, I usually go back into my personal life and kind of start, whether it's with materials or with ideas, and uh, that, that's the initial inspiration. And so I was doing a lot of yoga. So I thought, okay, I'm going to take yoga mats and make drawings on yoga mats. And like, you know what? They were like, crap. So, I mean, but it takes me a while to figure out what I want to do. 
so I do make a lot of bad art. Now I wish my students were on this to be able to hear this, but uh, um, we're all your students at the moment. This is fabulous. Thank you, Tell it. <laughs> um, anyway, so I was making this work and I was just, I mean, it, I'm sure the artists here know it is not, you know, th this discomfort, you know, you're sure you're never going to make art again or something, you know, it's like that. Anyway, um, while I was making the drawings on the yoga mats, I was working with these pastels that were, they were called pan pastel and you need an applicator and you put a sponge on the applicator to apply the pastels. So I hated the art, but I really liked these sponges. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I just really like these sponges. So I went up one night. I mean, this is literally how it happened. I went up one night to the computer, to the, um, to my computer, I typed in sponges and, you know, different things came up and there was cosmetic sponge. And I was like, oh my God, there is something here. I had nothing else, but, you know, because I dealt with issues of femininity and I dealt with gender and then this cosmetic sponge comes up. I'm like, I know there's something here. I'm going to buy 5,000. So I took it. I love you bought 5,000 and not like five. Whatever it was. <laughs> Um, whatever it was, I was going to gamble, right? Yeah. So I ordered these and these boxes come and I don't know what to do with them. And I thought, okay, pastels influence these. I'm going to start putting pastels all over them. And they were just so sensuous and lovely, these miniature things, but I still didn't know what to do with them. So I have to, for some reason, I have to make a lot of something. So I give myself quantity to then be able to do whatever I want. So I just decided I'm going to bide my time and color these sponges, you know, rainbows of color. So then I had the opportunity to take them to um, do a show in Alaska. And I worked with the students. So they were all shipped up there. They were different colors. And basically the students and I created that floor piece that you showed. And that was the first time something happened. I didn't love mm -hmm. it, but it also mm -hmm. led me to the next step. And the next step was that I wanted to glue them to canvas. And I was influenced by um, uh, hanging gardens on mm -hmm. architectural walls. So that I started gluing the sponges um, onto the canvas. So here's the... Uh, here's the garden and then I put them up and then and when I I'm trying to wait till I don't know if you have a slide of um an image with the with their hanging straight nope hanging straight you know mm. like we just just the art, art anyway um basically I glued the sponges first to canvas they yeah. you know I would put them on my wall and I wouldn't color them till later, but when you see them before they're bunched up, like we're looking at now, they have an architectural feel to them. You feel like you're looking down on them, right? When oh, I start yeah. to, so it, it when I start to um, make them more voluptuous, like what you're seeing here, it takes, it feels more like nature. So for me, these pieces were an intersection of architecture and nature. Mm. Does that make sense? And they yes. also were, um, when you put a lot of them in a room, they absorb sound. So yeah. you would walk by them and it was, you know, there you had this quiet. So that also happens a lot in my work that there's this busy, busy, busy making all the work. And when the work goes on the wall, there's a real quietness to the end product. Um, and as you can see on all this work, it's very labor intensive. And I've been fortunate that I usually have a small team of people working with me and we're all gluing sponges or we're all sewing wire or whatever. And it's, it's kind of like a quilting bee and stories are shared that are so wonderful. There's something about working with one's hands that breaks down barriers and there's yeah. people are willing to be more vulnerable and share life stories and for me that's a huge amount of content that's in the work that nobody knows except the people that um were helping me make you know make the work so i really yeah. value i really value those conversations 
Oh, fantastic. Anna says, yeah, it reminds her of typography and, yeah, absolutely. Um, and Pam, just loving it, loving the creative brain in action. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janice. That's Thank great. you all. <laughs> so during the pandemic, your sponge work evolved again and you started cutting off to emphasise the texture and I'll jump to the image here that sort of shows it. And, and Anna, I, I do agree, it, it becomes very... That's the architectural type of that. one. That's the architectural one. That's one that works on architectural, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. How did the pandemic influence your or change your creative process? Well, I'm not sure exactly if the pandemic came first or my thinking to myself, I cannot glue one more sponge. You know, <laughs> it was... <laughs> It was around the same time. Um, and um, I will credit my dog, who's uh, lying right here. I wanted to kill her when this happened a couple years before, but I was uh, getting ready to take a show somewhere, and there was a U-Haul downstairs, and she was a puppy, mm -hmm. and she came up to one of these sponge pieces and just bit into them you know, took out all the, I was just like, I couldn't believe it. Anyway, X amount of years later, there was something I liked about her biting. And I started thinking, I'm going to tear these down so that I um, would just be left with textures and uh, kind of res residue. Um, and in, in doing that, I, there's something that I think in my work that I, I seem to build to tear down there was kind of like this deconstructing that I wanted to see what was underneath all these cosmetic sponges. And I think what the pandemic uh, brought up was my wanting to be more vulnerable in the work and the, the large constructions um, felt more like they were armor in a way, even though they were seductive and they had all the different content to it, it was hiding what was behind them. And, uh, and during the pandemic, I kind of started, as I started tearing off the sponges, I wanted them to be more like skin-like and I wanted them to have more of a sense of fragility. I did not know that I was gonna be doing what I was doing now, but this was the, the step into that. Nice. So what you're seeing nice. here are leftover, leftover um, pieces from the sponges. And if anybody wants um, some, I have plenty to, I'll be able to ship. <laughs> <laughs> ship the sponges. Yeah. 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 You must. I mean, you said you worked with a team, which is absolutely understandable. And I loved how you said about that shared conversation and how actually when we're making, um, it's quite a beautiful space to be in with people and you do open up. And we were talking about it last, this over the weekend, actually saying that, it kind of like when you're making and your hands are busy, it kind of allows for the silence, like the silence becomes acceptable and then it gives people yeah. that thinking time. Um, yep. Absolutely fascinating. I, a lot of times I say that my work is a meditation. You know, as I've mm. gotten older, I don't really all, I don't listen to music all that much, you know, and it is about just being in that process and the quiet. And yes. just a, the absorption into that. And, you know, artists don't get enough credit. I'll throw this in there for all the artists. Uh, I really think we don't get enough credit. Artists know we need to take care of our well-being. So every day we go in the studio and in a sense, we do our meditation, but we just happen to make something. You know, and the yeah. whole world is talking about mindfulness and well-being. You know, the myth of the... Uh, it's no, you have to be successful as an artist. You have to be in pretty good shape. So the myth of the artist, you know, as being crazy, it's, that's like an old myth. Do you understand what I'm saying? So I when do. you're talking about making these things, that repetitiveness, that uh, it's such a gift we give ourselves. Yeah. Thank you, Marjorie. That, do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's our, it's our own form of therapy. Yeah, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Heidi's loving how you share your process and how you work with others. Thanks, Heidi. That's lovely. Thank you. Um, Janice, going back to the subway floors, yes, they were resin, weren't they? 
Yes, they were. Yeah. It was, they were printed on a mesh fabric and then they were embedded in resin. Yeah. Ah, oh, great. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Karen's also a love, beautiful artist who we've got coming up next week, I think, Karen. I can't wait to hear about your work, but, yeah, blown away. Yep. Absolutely. So we see another shift in your work here and we're going again back. We didn't really talk about the paint by numbers too much, but you start moving into more the digital realm here as well with your work. Talk us through the next few images here, Marjorie. So I, what I started to do, um, you showed some images in the um, initial slide you know, before we, before we started talking, I started to want to make the um, work more mixed media. Yes, incorporate the sponges, but go back to putting them in the context of uh, an installation. And then the idea of garment and those kinds of things started to show up. But I used the process that I did for the subway station with the tapestries. And I would show up uh, to this place that where there's a huge flatbed scanner and like eight feet. And I would show up with all these um, cosmetic sponge constructions and the guy would let me like fold them over each other and make, you know, he would take scan, they would be scanned high, high, high um, resolution. So what I started to do was take the scans and bring them into Photoshop. And I started to draw on top of, you know, trace, um what you're seeing and then mm. i took it one more step and i had a student help me because i am not miss digital at all that we then did take a paint by number template and put it on top of the sponge constructions and what you're seeing in in that drawing is where things would break down if i was to go paint them so you know it showed uh you know the lightest areas then middle ground uh, and dark. So I never painted them, and I, but I loved the lines. I loved the yeah. energy of the lines. And so what started to happen is that's what became the imagery now that's some of the imagery that's embedded in these new this new body of work, if that makes yes. sense. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And this new body of work, it's, I have to admit, it's one of my favorites. I think it's the colors, it's the textures, it's the dimensionality of it. And it's like the wall is coming alive into the artwork. It's not like artwork on a wall. It's like all encompassing. Talk to us about Undercover, which is the name of this body work or this series. Yeah. Um, well, this, uh, this work and then the work that I'm uh, currently doing that's more just with the materials started to become the story of the yellow wallpaper has been an undercurrent in my work for 20 or 30 years. And it's not one of, um, you know, it's a difficult story. And I don't know, do you want me to um, talk about it a little bit? Yeah, go for it. Um, so it was written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman and it's, it's a, uh, it, it's a short story where the main character's name is Jane had just um, had a baby and her husband, who's a doctor, takes her to their summer home because she's not doing well. Um, and basically now we know that it probably was postpartum depression, but they didn't know that back then. And he took her to their summer home, isolated her in an attic room uh, with her journal. And the only connection to the real world was through one window that she could see out for the back garden. And then he eventually took away the journal so that she was in this room with this dilapidated yellow wallpaper and she started looking and hallucinating into this wallpaper. And, and it was really her demise. She started to see people behind the wallpaper and she wanted to get to those people. So my work, um, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in taking that and to, uh, as a way to say we need community. And, you know, so probably we know from the pandemic that isolation um, is the worst thing that can happen, to, you know, to when you're, uh, especially when you're having emotional issues. So for me, 
I wanted to subvert, subvert that uh, story and give it some hope in that the wallpaper that people could detach from the wallpaper and bring it forward. So it wasn't going into the wallpaper. It was about seeing things in the wallpaper and then bringing them out. And so um, that's kind of where that's kind of where it all you know this got initiated. Wow, um, that's fascinating. The other thing I guess really about this is that I'm mm -hmm. always saying to myself or to my students, "Is the work talking to you?" You know, so this idea of talking to the to the wallpaper to one's work is not necessarily a bad thing, right? I actually think in the world I live in now, and probably the artists that are on this call or just with students, when the work talks, it's really powerful. It's like it, it's about it resonating. So, and that's when I say to myself and to my students, um, listen, you know, pay attention. Whereas when the wallpaper talked to this woman, you know, it was a whole different situation. So I, I but I played on that idea, I think in the work. I'm not Fantastic. doing such a great job necessarily describing this, but oh, um, yeah. I'm you do bringing so optimism great. to it. Yeah. You're doing so great. And this is kind of the first time we really see human interaction and participation within the work. Can you talk us through the importance of that for you? And, and I guess now moving forward as well, it seems to be something you're moving forward into the next current bodies of work as well. Well, the interesting thing is, you know, uh, I think there's a narrative in life and, you know, making work as one lives. It's like you go around and around and you pick up things that you started earlier in life and that come back. Because when I did my MA show, it was about setting my master's show was about setting up an installation and, and having a couple hours each day when people could come and rearrange the work. So that it was my initiation of it, and then people participated. So that's one of the ways I want to, you know, bring um, community into the work with that kind of participation. And this was the, um, you know, this initi initiated initiated this idea. Mm. And so also right now, you don't know whether she's attached to the wall or going to break away from the wall. So there is a little bit of a play on camouflage you know, as well. Yeah. yeah. So, Marjorie, is the idea that spectators or the audience would come in and they're allowed to actually touch the work and wrap themselves in it? Or were these photos taken for more like the publicity or the, like, how does it work in terms of the gallery space? To be honest, it, this was taken more for publicity. And as we know, touching artwork is, you know, so we're not supposed to do that. However, <laughs> I would like to bring that into my, to my work. And I'm not sure how successful that's, you know, going to be. So that's one of the things I have to work out. But one of the, without the garment aspect of it, I would like to create these false walls, so to speak, or wallpaper and to use zippers and to use magnets and other uh, pins uh, and Velcro so that parts of the wallpaper could come off and they could move to different locations in the gallery. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So it's not only just the, the idea of garment, it's the idea of parts of the uh, wallpaper. Yeah, yeah, I love this next uh, series here. So we're, we're really seeing the influence of the digital uh, typography, I'll call it digital typography of the sure. sponges here. And then you've created your own wallpaper and now you start into people are starting to interact and you even start projecting the artwork onto, onto, I will say your assistants, your, your helpers. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, it was, it was, this is my inquiry, you know, so there's, I, you know, like when I give an assignment with my students, we have a, we have a week of research and development. So when mm -hmm. I was starting this, I, I, I still wasn't, I'm still not even to right now, I'm still not exactly sure how this is all going to work, but these are little moments that, uh, I get to look at to reconnect me so that I can leap from here. So this is about being caught in the drawing as well as does she have the strength to pull away? And this obviously too is about entanglement. But, you know, we all get entangled. It's like we just don't want to stay entangled, right? So mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Lorna Crane, hi, Lorna, says typography of the psyche. <laughs> I might have that's to a- steal that. <laughs> Lorna, yep, it's gone now. You've let it out there. <laughs> Beverly, you've asked a question as well that I was keen to to share and ask as well. Marjorie, I mean, you've got to store, you know, millions of sponges, (laughs) or you did. (laughs) Do you have a large space to work in? And, yeah, do you um, make or make in sections? Yeah, so, like, how do you organise your space and and is it a large space? Well, I guess it depends on what large is. (laughs) Um, For me... uh, when I was in New Mexico, I built a studio and, and it was beautiful, 15 foot ceilings and it was a big open space, but I also rented uh, a storage space, you know, and then it would be a trade-off. Am I going to keep renting and paying money for storage or, you know, like what was the trade-off? Should I get rid of that work and put new work in? Where I am now is I have a, I bought a 5,000 square foot home <laughs> because it had a fourth floor, to be honest, you know, it was like yeah. the attic. Um, and so that I opened up the third floor. So I have two floors, you know, as a studio, but I'm going to complain for a second, but, and I really shouldn't, but I don't like having my studio space in my home. You know, the, the, the domestic aspect of it is, is, um, a bit bothersome, but I have about 2000 square feet, you know, for a studio so I can make things you know, most people work like in my next life, maybe I'll come back and be able to work within a rectangle or something. So this would be a lot of space for, you know, painters. Right. But because I make so much stuff, I could grow three times. So I'm not totally answering. It's a good amount of space for a lot of people and it's okay for me. You know, yeah. That kind That's of thing. fascinating, isn't it? Do you think if you had a larger space, you would be even more prolific and even get even bigger? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing about my work, if you noticed or for people to understand, is that one of the things, I mean, I don't know if it started because I had a smaller space that well, that I wanted to make a lot of things that accumulated, right, so that I would have um, big, uh, you know, it would I could make an installation. But for sure, being in a domestic space and being in my house, I have to think about how work's going to be transported right? And stored. So again, mm. the sponge pieces could be rolled up. This works even easier to store. So I get to make large pieces and kind of also have the experience of uh, work that's intimate. And I think we we talked about this before, um, that the issue of the body again comes back in that um, I feel I'm fortunate because I work with all these details in these individual, whether it's stitching or how, putting on pastel. So there's an intimate relationship to the objects. And then, and uh, there's a woman, her name is Susan Stewart, who talks, she wrote a book a long time ago called On Longing. And she talks about the miniature and the gigantic. And when we look at things that are very small, we, it's, we first experience it in our mind and there's a lot of like nostalgia or thinking back to when we were a time past. And when things get monumental and bigger than our bodies, we first access it through our bodies before we get into an intellectual or thinking stage. So for me, I get the best of both worlds. <laughs> you know, that's kind yeah. of, that's what I, my experience anyway. Yeah, so fascinating. I yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to move on now to, again, this is something that you're working on now where you're now incorporating the digital back into the sponges and now we're back in, we're actually working with your fabric and your fibre and your stitched work. Right. Talk us through this image. Well, this was a, this is a happy accident. And if there are any students on the phone, they know I use this, um, that expression a lot because I actually did just do this this week, but I wanted it to be part of this um, uh, interview because I think it's where the work's going and it also shows people how the the different generations of how the work um, is made. So going back to the sponges and kind of reintroducing them shows shows the relationship and then also gives you a different sense of tactility. 
So, you know, those kinds of things. And I don't know if I now will photograph this with the sponges on them, then send it out to be digitally reproduced on fabric and chopped up. So um, this is just kind of what I think this is the way the work's going to be moving now. If that's my gut feeling. Yeah, fantastic. And I wanted to show people, uh, we wanted to show people a little video of a close up of the scanned images onto that have, have been printed onto fabric. I'd just love to show that now. It goes for 30 seconds, Marjorie. So that text, when you see the writing, is the yellow wallpaper. You know, I, oh. I translated the yellow wallpaper, or transposed it or whatever into text, and that's what is written there. Wow. Wow. That book, Marjorie, must is so profound for you. It's incredible. Yeah, that's beautiful. We're getting into sewing. Tell me about <laughs> <laughs> describe your journey into creating these amazing, unique garments, wall art, installation type work, interactive work. <laughs> Tell me how improper, and I say improper, sewing techniques became the hallmark of your style. Well, as we've seen so far, in terms of my being honest about how I make work and not knowing what I'm doing, I continue working that way. So I have always kind of this been a tug of war between going into textiles or fashion or making um, installation or work and um, installation or um, artwork on that side, side of the fence. So I decided I wanted to kind of have my feet in a couple camp. You know, I wanted to, now you're talking about bridging the gap. I would say possibly now, maybe that's what I'm up to. Um, and so that the, these pieces could come off the wall and become a part of a garment and other parts of the garment could zip on. There could be multiple parts that would zip on, you know, zip on and off. And that's kind of what we're, we're looking at here. But when I first started making the work, first of all, somebody had to teach me how to sew on the sewing machine. I never, I'm not kidding you. I never had some. So um, I learned, uh, but to make a garment without uh, it looking like it was sewn by a beginner, you know, a beginner, I decided I was going to start to cut all the material into strips and that would camouflage the fact that I didn't know what I was doing. That's how the, mm. that's how this started is just a way to camouflage my lack of skill. And then, you know, it just, it just multiplied from there and became also very interesting texture. And then people, again, I'm just thinking of this now when I'm looking at this image, people would say to me, you know, that looks like tree bark or that looks, which I, you know, it was just one of those things that um, revealed itself. So then it spoke back to nature. So it's again about constructed nature and mother nature, but really the not knowing how to sew and playing around with the tension created what I call glitches. Um, I, for those of people who know, you should keep the tension the same between the bobbin and uh, what you're sewing. And I would, I would not do that so that it would create, hey, you know, it would create a mess with the, um, with the thread. And, but I loved it. You know, it's like, I wanted to show that the hand, I mean, I guess that's really what it is handmade i wanted to show that it's not about perfection and you don't have to always put on a perfect face and you know all those kinds of things and um it also speaks to recycling it also speaks to aging it the work looks like skin it looks like it could have been tattooed there's it just speaks to a lot of different things and then the material be can become both a garment that's a second skin on our body but if it goes on the wall it's kind of like a second skin for architecture. So I, I, I want to play with that. Yeah. 
I, I want to show a video here, another video, if you don't mind. Just it really shows off the magnific magnificent details and the zippering. Um, again, just 20 seconds. just want to show people a close-up here. It's great. Yeah, I love it. I do want to touch it, Marjorie. It's not fair that we're not allowed to. <laughs> You'll have to come in January and I'll let you. I'll let you make something too. <laughs> it's the best part of my job. I say it's the best part of my job. I get to touch. <laughs> sometimes I say my brains are in my hands. I really think yeah. sometimes they are. Yes, there's got to be a science in that, surely. There's, there's, there's research in that that shows that, yeah. Talk to me about generational inheritance so this this body of work you know it's about you know attachments and almost like the gifts and burdens that we inherit inherit um how do you symbolize these concepts through your choice of materials and techniques like i mean we've spoken about the zippers magnets pins and velcro talk to us about the theme of that generational inheritance and attachments well, I think this came out of also um, uh, the pandemic and uh, spending mm. a lot of time at home and the issue of trauma was being discussed like heavily and different forms, uh, different therapeutic models were um, being discussed. And that I got this expression, uh, this generational inheritance from one of the podcasts that I was listening to. And I think, I think um, if you're anything... I don't think my mother's on here, so I can say this. Um, <laughs> if you're anything like I am, like I, I love my mother, but when sometimes in the mirror, I'll look and I'm like, I see her. And, you know, mm. I've spent so much of my life acknowledging her, but also, you know, wanting to be my own person and uh, moving forward that I, but I, it, that, which is true, but I also have to understand that, I'm taking her codes of conduct with me. I'm taking my grandmothers with me. I'm taking great grandparents. I'm taking, you know, communities in different times with me. So I'm playing with that and using patterns as a way to speak to that. I don't expect necessarily people to come into the installation and go, oh, she's dealing with generational inheritance. But those are the ideas that are driving the work and how the, um, patterns populate and also kind of go in their own directions. Mm, so my, my to be honest, my, my question to myself right now is how important is it that um, people know that specifically? And should I, should I put more references to it? Should I put like a Victorian pattern on the wallpaper? So it makes the linkage to um, the story or, is the experiential part of it, like the felt narrative enough of it, is that powerful enough just as it, and that's kind of, I struggle with that, I think throughout my career, but I also am kind of, um, be, I'm being honest, that's something I uh, am trying mm. to figure out right now. I love that uh, we started talking about felt narratives in the beginning and we've gone through the journey of, some of your major bodies of work, and of course, there's been hundreds of images in between, and and memories and bodies of work in between. And we've discussed how, and you've spoken about your work is about posing questions rather than offering solutions, um, right. which I find fascinating. Um, and as we conclude our discussion, I was wondering if you could share what the primary question or message you hope viewers will take away from engaging with your art. Oh, God, did you have to do that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what question would you like us to think about when we're looking at you? I guess, um, I guess this issue of pausing or taking time, um, both for a viewer and um, maker, that things are so much more complex than they seem on the surface and that 
I think all of us need to make that extra effort uh, to whether it's getting to know people, to understanding our work or other people's work. And so um, that's just, that's like a dilemma of how, how to bridge that in terms of making this complicated work and knowing you want to communicate to others and, and wanting them, you want to bring them in, but how do you have to, how much do you have to do it? I, I'm not articulating this well, but it is something in this inquiry of things are far more complicated than how they look on the surface. I think yeah. that's, um, that, yeah. that's something I would like to think people to think about that comes out of my work that's it's not necessarily what you see but what's behind it yeah a question that came into my mind when you were just talking now and I was picturing myself walking into one of your installations or one of, and seeing some art or any any art it doesn't necessarily need to be yours and the question I was asking myself was what do I need to understand about myself to appreciate this, what I'm seeing in front of me? Thank you. You know, you know mm. if more people, if people could, yeah, I mean, that's the goal, isn't it? Is to mm. have, um, you know, sure, I would like to sell more work and I would, you know, all those kinds of things. But if we could get people to get involved in that process of inquiry, then we all win. Then yeah. we all win. Um, yeah. And uh, that's what keeps me making art. You know, that's what keeps me making art. This kind of, to be honest, I told you I get teary eyed sometimes. So I might right now. Yeah. But this is what keeps me making art. Is this kind of dialogue. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, <laughs> I can't believe Madri. it. Oh, Madri, thank you. Thank you. And look, I've got goosebumps. Honestly, I do. And and I'm sure, yeah, yes, perfect response to think about. Yeah, absolutely. We're all with you, Marjorie. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if I'm a fiber artist, you know, but fiber is really important to my process and the sense of touch. And I really, really thank you for um, bringing me into your world. Oh, to share Marjorie. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your world and thank you for sharing your insides in terms of your thoughts and process and your outsides, which is your artwork with us today. <laughs> Amazing. It's just been, you know, it's been a lot of work behind the scenes getting this ready and we really wanted to be prepared <laughs> for each other. And I think we've right. both done an amazing job. I'm going to pat myself on the back. I'm going to pat you on the back. I'm going to say thank you so much to wow. everybody who's watched today. I'm just glad that it's been so special this last hour. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm going to play a slideshow now and pop up all your beautiful comments and then hang on the line and we'll say a quick private goodbye before okay. we go. Great. Thank you, thanks everybody, everyone. for attending. Yeah, thanks, everyone.